Uh, we'll now be hearing from Mike about disposable infrastructure and, and tell your server that once you finish using them. <laughs> okay, so um, as everyone does, start with an easy topic that you know everything about yourself. Um, so I'm currently a senior site reliability engineer for Clarinet Bastion. Um, Bastion as a company, we were acquired by Clarinet last year. Um, we specialize in public cloud um, migrations, uh, so that can range from just coming in and helping you with one that you're doing yourself to doing it uh, for you to also then running it for you once you know, you're up and running in the cloud. Um, eventually the Bastion name will disappear and will just be known as the public cloud practice inside uh, Clarinet. Uh, so my background is uh, software engineering, that's what I started. I was a Java developer uh, for many years, um, but because I liked open source software and I wanted to run Postgres, uh, we needed to run Linux. Uh, Windows wasn't supported when we first started using Postgres. Uh, and so as a consequence, I picked up system administration because our Windows admins did not want to touch Linux boxes. Um, and uh, sort of in between the two of those, I've done quite a lot of systems engineering as well. My most recent uh, employer before my current one, I was head of systems engineering there. So I've kind of run uh, the gauntlet. And uh, if you've read the book Site Reliability, Reliability Engineering from Google, published by O'Reilly, um, that's pretty much what they describe a site reliability engineer as, is a kind of mixture of those three disciplines. So it's kind of nice to have a title that matches what I actually do. Um, so I've contributed to a number of open source projects. YAL, a workflow engine, uh, mostly run by Queensland University of Technology in Australia. Um, Postgres, uh, some of the XML features in 9.1 uh, and uh, a number of bug fixes to the JDBC driver over the years. And more recently, I've made some contributions to Terraform um, for its uh, Google Cloud SQL um, resource. Uh, and so I've been using Linux and open source software since 1999. Um, so the talk here, the overview, uh, we're going to look at kind of your typical cloud migration strategies and um, uh, kind of a bit straw man them and um, why they don't often work out the way you hope they will. Um, so you know, the drawbacks here. Uh, and then I'm going to kind of lay down what I'm calling the five theses of a disposable infrastructure uh, and then how we go about building a disposable infrastructure. So. Um, the first approach to migrating to the cloud is the one we come across the lo a lot. Uh, it's basically, let's duplicate our racks exactly, like for like, in the cloud. Um, sometimes it's a case of actually we're going to use the cloud as a spare capacity. Uh, so I have seen some places where, uh, sorry, genomics places in particular, some geospatial places where they have quite a uh, heavy processing burden, they actually just bring up instances into the cloud, run that, bring it down, but actually they keep everything together. So uh, you end up temporarily managing a whole bunch of extra stuff uh, and you find that these temporary servers don't have the same discipline as your static servers. Um, the other approach is the brave new world. Uh, so we're gonna leave our existing stuff here and we're going to build something completely brand new, our kind of version two of our product. And uh, you know, this, this is how we're going to get to the cloud. And eventually we'll, we'll decommission our old stuff, we'll move the customers over. And you know, that sounds quite fantastic. So looking at the kind of lift and shift approach, uh, it is quite appealing. You know, we've got a direct mapping of your existing infrastructure to the cloud. Um, you know, load balancers simply become elastic load balancers. Uh, your storage area networks become maybe a collection of buckets or maybe you might use something like the elastic <laughs> file system. Uh, I'll apologize, I will favor AWS terms over anybody else uh, simply because I work a lot more on AWS than, um, well I've never worked on Azure but I've done quite a bit with Google. Um, but a lot of these, you, know, you can imagine the equivalent terms for the, uh, the other providers. Um, actually, it should come back. I was warned that this will We're talking will about the appeal of lift and shift, that you've got the kind of direct mapping um, conceptually from what you've got in your kind of physical uh, tin to this virtual uh, tin. Um, so it's, it's often perceived as a quick win um, to, to get to the cloud. You actually don't theoretically need a huge detailed knowledge of the inner workings of whichever cloud platform you're going for um, because you already know how you run stuff. You're just, you're only changing where it's running, not really how it's running. 
Um, so the appeal of the kind of brave new world approach is that you've got no legacy baggage. So you're not having to figure out how to move some server that's uh, been <coughs> sitting collecting dust, run something critical but nobody really knows. Um, you haven't got to figure out how to you know, move that software. Um, quite a lot of the time we find organizations have no configuration management at all on uh, really old systems and so you end up burning a lot of time trying to figure out how this beast works. Um, but uh, so you know jettison that kind of legacy baggage. Um, you've got free reign for experimentation um, because you're not being constrained by what you've currently got. You're, you're you know, inventing this whole new world. You can do whatever you require. Um, so a lot of people perceive this as a low risk adoption strategy um, for the cloud because if it doesn't work, just throw it away. That's fine, we've still got our existing infrastructure, we haven't touched that, so we haven't introduced risk to the whole uh, estate that we've been running for you know, however long our business has been around. Um, so are we really doing cloud when we take either one of these approaches? Um, are we just actually building traditional but virtual data centers that happen to be running in the cloud? Um, you know, lift and shift is operationally the same. We haven't changed any of uh, quite often very old practices on how we run systems. Um, actually, the big problem with the brave new world is it isn't part of the real world. Um, it's just stuck out almost on a limb. Um, so. How are we actually leveraging the power of dynamic infrastructure? Um, you know, our infrastructure is now scalable just by the very nature of being in the cloud, but is our application scalable? Um, you know, are we actually using um, infrastructure as a service where actually we could be using platform as a service? Uh, so for example, running a message broker where you could be taking advantage of something like a uh, simple queuing service or Google's PubSub. So, penalty of a lift and shift, um, we're changing only where our hardware is. Um, instant size is based on current hardware size. So you're actually taking that burden of uh, overcapacity straight to the cloud because you're too terrified to change too many variables. You know, we're moving to the cloud. That's a big enough variable we're changing. Uh, well, let's not play around with um, other things. Um, Quite often, there's no change to the two-year deployment process. Actually, you just you're up and running over here. You haven't changed how you get software there and how you deal with provisioning, um, and you end up with stunted scalability um, because you've just taken what you've got and you've put it there. Um, your options are quite often just limited to increasing the virtual hardware, so more memory, more cores, um, or if you're lucky and you're running just web servers, you can add more nodes behind um, a load balancer. But that's about the limits of your, your scaling options. Um, so the penalty of a brave new world is that you're organizationally isolated. Um, you've got limited impact to existing processes because everybody's carrying on running like they always have. You're off here in this corner doing something new. Um, Quite often, this leads to a us versus them mentality, where you're doing all the new funky stuff. Sometimes you see uh, jealousy developing. The people looking after the old stuff are going, well, I, why am I not doing the new stuff? And you end up with this kind of artificial uh, barrier between these kind of two worldviews. Um, the focus of a brave new world is often on the functionality of the application, um, with your infrastructure seeing being seen just essentially as a, as a necessity. So it's not a um, first class citizen in this project. You're just spinning up some instances in order to show that you're developing the new functionality of your 2.0 um, product. Um, actually, a Brave New World project has a high chance of failure. Um, carefree scoping leads to unfocused um, projects. Uh, you can just you know, continue taking on and taking on and taking on, saying, oh, well, you know, we, we can deal with that, we can deal with that. So keen to demonstrate the success that actually you're just making a, a project that's not possible to complete. Um, and when you do get it done, actually you lose a whole bunch of time trying to integrate this to your old um, infrastructure. Uh, so you end up having to shoehorn in 
uh, whatever the monitoring and alerting systems are of the old system in order to not disrupt um, the current operational practices. Um, so, um, well, this slide has a couple of big long quotes on, so apologies. I don't know if any of you have come across Conway's Law. It states, organizations with design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Um, <laughs> uh, Keith Morris in Infrastructure as Code writes, in many cases applying existing patterns will, at best, miss out on opportunities to leverage newer technologies to simplify and improve the architecture. At worst, replicating existing patterns with the newer platforms will involve adding even more complexity. And uh, good old Fred Brooks of Mythical Man Month uh, fame, uh, he says, a scaling up of a software entity is not merely a repetition of the same elements in larger size. It is necessarily an increase in the number of different elements. In most cases, the elements interact with each other in some, no some nonlinear fashion, and the complexity of the whole increases much more than linearly. So kind of the upshot of these kind of what these three guys are saying is that if you're not aware that uh, in your organization, you build what your organization looks like, you're trapped to building your organization again. Um, with uh, what Keith is stressing is that um, just applying what you already know doesn't actually help you leverage anything new, and just simply moving to new platforms only ends up with, with greater complexity. And uh, with Fred Brooks, he's saying as you scale, you actually end up with uh, a lot more complexity because it's usually communication paths um, multiplying in a nonlinear manner. Ooh, maybe, maybe. Yes. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I think that's dead. <laughs> yep. Let me get the. There we are, okay, and let me get back to where we were. So, yeah, yeah. Right. lots of text, moving on. <laughs> so the five theses of a disposable infrastructure. The attitude you have to your environment will determine the limits of your scalability. Continuous integration and delivery is a must. Your applications need to be rebuilt or built, if you are starting over, to fit a dynamic infrastructure. Dynamic infrastructure must be treated as a first-class citizen in any cloud project. Planning to fail will lead to success. So I'm going to go through each of these now. Um, so attitude. The more you care about individual things, the more they'll hold your attention. So if you have dropped, put a lot of focus on something, you keep looking at it. You keep focusing on that. And if you look at a lot of the individuals, you end up spending a lot of time spread very thin across the entirety of your estate. Uh, in a truly scalable environment, you should only care about the combination of many individual things. So you're looking at, at kind of combinatory units rather than individual components. So living in the Iron Age, you treat your servers like pets. As some of you may have come across this analogy before. Um, the idea is that uh, you give them names. So people often have a naming convention. I tended to favor um, things to do with the Inuit people um, of my native country. Uh, you give them homes. You know, you've got racks or maybe you're, they're co-located. Uh, and if they fail, you do everything possible to save them. Every server here is an investment. Um, you know, you, you usually buy the best hardware that you can afford at that point in time. Um, it's amortized over many years, usually, and um, you have to have excess capacity to allow for growth. Um, so you're buying new database servers, you're kind of be targeting maybe 20% utilization when you start, and that gives you a lot of headroom for you know, customer growth. Uh, and actually getting these new servers usually takes weeks, especially if you have a particularly slow um, finance department. So living in the cloud age, you treat your servers like cattle. Uh, they have identifiers. You, know, like you think of the, the branding of old. Um, you actually only care where they are geographically. Um, so the, the fact that it's in, in Dublin is 
only interesting if you need to keep Dublin, uh, sorry, data in Dublin, uh, or the fact that it's in the US, same thing. It's only about what you're, what you're keeping there. You don't actually care where in Dublin those servers are. You just trust that they're looked after, and that's what you're paying for. Um, and if you fail, well, you put them down and you get a new one. It's as simple as that. Um, so here, your architecture is your investment. Uh, you can choose a configuration based on your current load. Uh, so this is you know, the number of cores, amount of memory, um, and you get to pay for what you use. Uh, so you're immediately dealing with uh, your overspend on excess capacity because you only need to pay for what you're using. Of course, that does rely quite a bit on getting that configuration step right. Um, and capacity can be added when required. Um, provisioning new servers takes seconds. But I think this analogy doesn't go far enough. Are we actually just herding our pets? In the case of lifting and shifting, that's almost certainly what we're doing. Um, you know, putting things in scaling groups is a start, but it's not really the end of having a really you know, disposable infrastructure. Uh, how are we managing all these virtual servers? Uh, complex cloud scripts that are perhaps triggering puppet runs when they start up. Uh, do we try and set up a, a puppet master somewhere in this to look after all these, these nodes? Um, does the traditional configuration management approach even make sense in a cloud environment? So the disposable infrastructure. Everything is a package and can be discarded. And if you think about um, single-use products, you, you open them up, you use it, you get rid of it. Um, so we have things that are prepackaged for a particular purpose. Um, we still care where they are geographically, but beyond that, we really don't care. Uh, if, if they fail, you toss it away and you get another one. Um, you automate everything. So your servers are actually immutable. They start up, they already have their configurations, nothing's changing when they're starting. Uh, maybe with the exception of some kind of final injection of some environment settings to you know, talk to maybe to a service like Council to do your service discovery. Um, but you know, we never make manual changes to these instances. So let's get to automation. Let's be continuous. Repeatability brings reliability and predictability. Um, the way we do this is we set up a build pipeline so it ensures that the same process is followed for every change we make to our environment. Now this is both at the infrastructure level and at the application level. So we're managing all of our change through you know, following the same kind of software development processes for our application and our infrastructure. And we're treating infrastructure as code. Uh, and this is, it's actually quite helpful because it provides an audit trail for every change. We can see when something was introduced, how, what testing stages it went through, uh, and we may see, you know, you think, how did that ever get live? Well, you can look back and go back and say, ah, okay, it went through these sets of tests. This particular scenario that we've encountered in live, we don't test for. Okay, we can improve. Um, and for the, um, uh, the kind of lean philosophers out there, uh, it gives visibility of your value stream. So if you've, if you've looked at the kind of Kanban and um, uh, kind of the Toyota production system, um, they talk a lot about identifying the value of your business. And one of the key things there is to be able to see how you get from uh, concept to cash. So you need to know well, how, how, the life cycle of the change, where changes get stopped, where they get delayed. And if you have everything throwing, flowing through a build pipeline, actually you've got most of that value stream visible right there. It's only the kind of initial idea getting to a build pipeline and then once it's in production what happens afterwards that you're not covering there. So um, your developers are already probably doing CI. Uh, this is nothing new. We've been talking about this in the kind of development world for probably nigh on 20 years now, maybe 15. Um, it is a standard for code development. So if we're going to develop servers as code, we should be following the same best practices that the developers do. Um, and it's actually the output of your continuous integration, your existing um, application continuous integration, can be the beginning of the continuous delivery for the entirety of your estate. It's worth stressing, I, you hear this mixed up, CD means continuous delivery, CD means continuous deployment. Um, continuous delivery doesn't have to mean continuous deployment. Uh, the idea is actually that every single change should be deployable 
unless you reject it at some point down that pipeline because it fails tests or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to deploy every change. Uh, you can put in uh, approval stages um, if you have a business that's actually quite <coughs> sensitive to, to change. Um, you get uh, places where training materials need to be updated if you're introducing new functionality. Uh, people have to be trained to, to see this. So continuous deployment doesn't always make sense for every um, business out there. But if you at least are able to continuously deliver, you have good software ready to go. You can launch it whenever is needed. So our applications need to be built or rebuilt to take advantage of the dynamic infrastructure. Uh, many applications expect a static infrastructure. Um, that you've got hard-coded assumptions in there, for example, that when you start up, the configuration that you've got isn't going to change while you're running. Um, so IP addresses are one of the easiest ones to find that you've got problems with when you, when you move things, and you quite often find even just doing that kind of classic lift and shift, you boot some um, bespoke software up in the cloud, and it's trying to talk to an IP address that doesn't exist in, this, uh, in the cloud. And it's just you know, baked in. There's an assumption that the mail server is always on 10.0.0.25 or something like that. Um, and uh, you know, that kind of hard coding, uh, or even just that um, it being there when you start up, but what happens if that particular node disappears in the cloud, comes back with a different IP address? Can you, can you even cope with that? Now, of course, there's strategies that you can employ in the cloud. Um, uh, in Amazon, you have the, um, the ENI, which is the Elastic Network Interface, so you can associate an Elastic IP to that, and that can be you know, mapped down to a box. But do you know what? If you don't care where things are and you're looking for things through things like service discovery, you don't have to go through all that hassle just to fix an IP address for um, a particular service. Uh, many applications are cluster unaware. Um, sticky sessions can help um, on you know, web applications, um, but uh, there are some protocols that just don't lo load balance very well. And if you've got um, kind of bespoke um, protocols in your, your application stack, they may not cope very well with having lots of nodes. Um, the kind of chatter and um, as such can just make things difficult. So that's something you often need to look at is, well, actually, how do you cluster um, my software. Now, it may be that when you run it, you only ever have a cluster of one, um, but you need to be able to grow that to meet the demands of your, um, you know, your future. Um, so this is the opportunity to refactor to contemporary architectural approaches. You know, service-oriented architectures and microservices, uh, they fit very well to uh, a, a dynamic infrastructure. They fit very well to continuous integration and continuous deployments. Um, <coughs> in most cases, you're looking at a transition from stateful services to stateless. Uh, stateless things scale far better than stateful things because with stateful things, you've got to deal with replication of state, um, persistence of state. Um, and you're then victim to you know, network partitioning and, and so on. Um, package everything using distribution packages. This is baked into every operating system, um, well, every Linux operating system at least, um, and whatever configuration management tool you're using has support for talking to yum or um, deb repositories and pulling packages out. So uh, instead of, you know, big huge Maven repositories and, and so on, actually bundle all your applications up as RPMs or, or DEBs, put them in a repository, um, and then use that to install the software. Um, choose a deployment strategy. Um, it's quite a good conversation to be had about whether you should bake machine images or whether you should be using containers. Um, Werner Vogels uh, at the um, AWS relaunch in November gave a really interesting kind of view on the difference between um, virtual machines, containers, and uh, lambdas. Uh, said it's all to do with the length of execution. If you expect something to be of long duration, you should be using a virtual machine. If you expect something to be a short duration, by which he meant uh, in the region of up to five minutes, container is a good fit. If you expect a really short duration of upwards of a minute, then lambdas are a good fit. And that seems to be a fairly good rule of thumb, but 
Um, I'm not entirely convinced that containers don't make sense on longer workloads. Um, so you should consider this at the start, make the decision and stick to it. You know, Docker might be appropriate, Kubernetes in your environment, perhaps, perhaps not. Um, don't fear vendor lock-in. This is something we see a lot. We get uh, people who are wanting to move to the cloud, but they immediately say, we don't want to be locked in. We think we want to go with Amazon, but maybe we'll go to Google somewhere down the line. Um, well, yeah, OK. But you have to consider this, the investment that you need to make to make yourself agnostic, to you know, run message brokers instead of just taking advantage of simple queuing services. Um, you know, you've got to automate the installation of this. You've got to configure it, and you have to accept the operational overhead of running a message service when you could just use simple queuing service. And actually, if you've got developers who are worth their salt, they can carefully make an abstraction of that API so that you, they code against your internal API for the messaging system. And if you do decide to switch from Amazon to, to Google, well, then you've only got a small little library that needs to be changed from understanding simple queuing service to PubSub. So dynamic infrastructure must be treated as a first class citizen in any cloud project. You know, design the infrastructure in parallel to your cloud-aware application changes. Uh, so you know, this ties in with taking advantage of the services that you're offered there, like Simple Queuing Service. We don't need the infrastructure now to run message, uh, you know, JMS or something. Um, mandate that every instance is part of a scaling group to help enforce the cluster awareness. Uh, as I say, you may actually come you know, running things, you only need one, but it's pretty good practice to have two, one and two separate availability zones, just in case Amazon have a problem with an availability zone. Um, it happens. Um, use the same principles for infrastructure development as you use for applications. So you know, follow the same things, code reviews, um, use version control, put the scripts that you're using to build this um, somewhere where other people can look at it. Um, Script and encode everything unless there's no API and tooling support. You do find uh, there are some things that you just have to go on to Google and Amazon's consoles to set them up. Uh, quite a lot of it's uh, certificates. Um, there's, most tooling doesn't support any way of uploading an SSL certificate, um, particularly uh, if you want to do uh, API gateway with Lambda, there's no support for that at the moment. You have to go and set up that domain and put the certificate in and then make an association. But once you've done that, the rest of it can be coded. Um, and you know, actually, maybe we can get people to code that. I'm not sure on that particular front whether that's just a case nobody's got around to doing it or whether there's no API. Um, you deploy the same infrastructure in development test and production environments. Um, you know, this is the, the classic thing that, oh, our, our development environment is not representative of our, our production environment. Uh, how many bugs are not found in testing and development because production behaves so differently. Um, now, you can parameterize the sizing of things. Um, quite often we see that um, uh, development is kind of medium size. Test staging is a kind of small size but tends to have a lot of scaling activity and production is huge. Um, because all the focus is on development, so the changes are happening here, and eventually some changes are being promoted into a staging environment. You have a scaling activity while everybody suddenly cares about that, and then it goes back to being idle. Um, so your deployment pipeline becomes an assembly of application packages and infrastructure configurations. This is where you're kind of uh, marrying the two strands of uh, development. Um, the kind of philosophy of hive cohesion and loose coupling applies to infrastructure as much as it does to um, applications. So where you're running things, uh, you think about how tightly coupled are all these different components. You know, in order to provide the database service, do I have to have all this other bits and pieces around that? Um, or can we kind of narrow it down and have, for example, a connection pooling mechanism on every machine? So planning to fail will lead to success. A classic kind of phrase, you know, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. So actually try and think about in terms of when it goes wrong instead of if it will go wrong. Um, 
the reality is you're running stuff in the cloud, failure is far more likely um, than when you're running things in, in TIN. Um, now, the advantage is that actually that kind of hardware failure, you're largely insulated against. Um, but what you're not insulated against is kind of the network problems. Or uh, in the case of S3 the other week, you've got a dependency on a service. Uh, Slack and um, a handful of others discovered this. And when Amazon had a problem with S3, everybody's got a problem. Um, we treat our infrastructure and its hosted application as disposable in conjunction with continuous um, delivery. It eliminates a number of these failure scenarios. Because actually, if you're everything you're running is always disposable, it doesn't matter that you've lost a handful of instances. It doesn't matter that an availability zone's gone down because everything's disposable. Uh, let's move the mouse. Wakey, wakey, there we go. Um, regularly test your disposability. Terminate instances at random. Make sure things keep running. Um, you know, block all network access to an instance. Uh, in my days of working in physical infrastructure, we used to go and pull cables out of things uh, just to see whether things would come back. In fact, a lot of the work I did on the YAL uh, engine was testing its recovery from when it lost the database. Uh, so you know, take it off the network, okay, did it come back up? Pull the power out, does it come back up? Um, answer was yes, after we made a lot of code changes. Um, seriously consider Chaos Monkey and the Simeon Army. Um, so these are scripts that Netflix have developed to actually test for this very thing. Um, they run these scripts during working hours and it randomly destroys whole parts of their infrastructure. And so they are constantly making sure that if things go wrong, they're still running. Um, there's a, a lot of merit to know, you know, if you're continually testing failure strategy, you're actually learning how to cope with it and should something happen, you know what, you've already tested this, you know what's going to happen, you're not going to be woken up to deal with it. Um, constantly churning disposable instances helps prevent configuration drift with immutable servers. So that's one of the biggest things you see when people talk about immutable servers is, well, it's all great and we're, well having this, it starts up, you don't change the configuration, um, but three, four months down the line, actually some things have changed. Well, if you're constantly churning stuff, it doesn't matter, your configuration isn't going to change. Well, the new configuration is going to appear more specifically. Availability and durability do cost. So actually, um, you should try and have oh, lots of small services rather than a number of big you know, servers. So if you've got lots of tiny little servers, a handful in each availability zone, that's going to cost you less than having two big meaty servers, one in each availability zone. It also insulates you better to one machine going down because you haven't got the other one now taking over uh, twice as much load. Um, Identify the, your points of failure and assess. How often will the failure occur? How do I mitigate this failure? How do I test this failure to ensure mitigation? And is the cost of mitigation worth the customer impact during failure? So uh, a good example is, do you really need to insulate against uh, an Amazon region failure? So a region is divided up into two or three availability zones. Um, is the you know, likelihood of Amazon losing all three of those availability zones. Um, do you really need to worry about that? Chances are probably not because most of your competitors are going to be affected by that, that region being down as well. So do you, you, know, you don't need to run twice as much infrastructure just to insulate against that particular use case unless you are a business that is operating at that kind of scale. So you know, be honest in assessing the worth of your business. Do you need to double those costs? Um, and as I already mentioned, Trello, Slack, and many other high-profile companies, including Amazon itself, were affected by the S3 outage. Their status page lived in that bucket. And so when the bucket failed, uh, they couldn't update that status page. So the status page for a number of hours said that everything was green. Um, pretty serious egg on face, really. They of all people, it's free for them to run in multiple regions. So you know, why didn't they? But here's the kicker. Data is not disposable. Um, and actually, your data is probably more important than your availability. Um, now you can you know, ship your log files to things like CloudWatch or StackDriver. Um, so you know, get those off, just standard um, sys, sys logging. Um, 
And here's another big thing. Make backups and regularly test they restore. Um, I don't know how many of you heard about GitLab's disaster a few weeks ago. They had five separate backup processes and they all failed. Wow, you know, this is pretty basic stuff. It's a database. You know, what happened was a Postgres database got, um, the, the guy thought he was on a test date uh, on the slave, but he was on the master, blew away the data directory. Um, and they lost, they'd already lost the slave, now they lost the master. And um, I think the, the closest backup they found was six hours prior or something. Um, but all, all the other backup strategies they had, five in total, just didn't work. It's worth going and having a look into that because they've been really, really honest and open about what happened, what they did. Um, so there's a huge, huge write-up um, about that. And of course, the nice thing is the poor guy who did that, he's not been sacked or anything. They've all said, you know, as a team, we were responsible for this. The poor guy had just been up late fixing a different problem. Something else went wrong. You know what? He shouldn't have even been on duty. They should have sent him home. Um, Consider storing your backups in both S3 and Google. Now, if there's a problem with S3, at least your data's in Google, vice versa. Um, you know, so store your backups in multiple regions as well. You know, this is where you should be spending your money in the cloud. Um, if you've got to use persistent disks, uh, because you've got maybe a, a GlusterFS uh, type setup where you need some sort of shared data storage, you've got media files or something like that, and for some reason S3 or Google's buckets don't make sense, um, actually use multiple disks uh, and create logical volumes with RAID 1s so that if something does happen to one um, elastic uh, block storage, you've still got another one. Um, snapshot those disks regularly. You know, save no expense on looking after your data. Um, test the durability of your data. Um, you know, user error is your bigger, biggest risk. I forgot the where clause. We had a production incident for one of our customers a few weeks ago because of that. Um, I thought I was in the test environment or that poor guy at GitLab, I thought I was on the slave. Um, regularly exercise data loss and recovery scenarios in your development and test environments. What happens if somebody blows away a whole table? What happens if somebody blows away the database? How long is it gonna take you to get that back? This is how you test your backups. This is how you test the recovery strategy. Hopefully, you'll never have to be there, but if you are there, you've got a rehearsed process, bang, bang, we've got our data back. Um, so just to kind of give you a, a flavor of that, um, you know, let's assume we have a front-end web application which places orders in a queue for subsequent asynchronous fulfillment by a separate application backed by a database. We've already refactored our applications for the cloud. So uh, we'll have two identical continuous integration pipelines which will produce AMI images. Um, we'll have a separate continuous delivery pipeline um, to execute the infrastructure as code. And our goal is to promote infrastructure and uh, AMIs between environments. So. GitHub, for our source, for argument's sake, we build, we test, we produce to be in packages, we run our repository out of an S3 bucket, we then use Packer to produce ourselves an AMI. Um, I forget why I had two separate streams now, but um, two separate applications, like, oh yes, the front-end web application and the back-end processing, that's why I've done that. Um, but the process is exactly the same. Um, so I don't know if many of you have come across Packer. Uh, it's an open source tool from HashiCorp. Uh, it allows you to create many different machine images. This is uh, cloud images, but also you can do virtual box, um, virtual um, oh, VMware. Um, here we go again. Um, and you can actually um, run normal configuration management tools. So it's got support to run um, Ansible Chef and Puppet uh, as provisioners is the, the term that they use. Um, so you can actually just write a shell script so you could just conceivably have install this package, install that package, install this package and um, you know, put these configuration files here um, but you know, use these guys. Um, they've got a lot of support for doing that in a fairly clean way. Um, actually consider creating a base image which is your hardened operating system image and then for each of your different applications have separate images on top of that. Uh, that way you haven't got to kind of go through those steps every time you're building a new image. 
Um, use placeholders or environment variables for configurations that will be filled by launch scripts. You want your environment configuration to be dictated by the environment. You don't want to be injecting this in. So leave placeholders here. When you get into the environment, the environment will tell you where the service location is, um, you know, console or something like that. Uh, so the infrastructure pipeline then, um, we've got our infrastructure code in, again, GitHub here. Uh, we've got our two AMIs. If anything changes in these three, we run, uh, the example here is Terraform, um, and we then apply these changes to our development environment. We run our integration tests, we seek approval, and we then promote that to the next environment up the chain. Um, so Terraform, it's been mentioned a few times, um, also from HashiCore, it's a declarative language for the construction of infrastructure. The beauty of this tool is that um, it's far less verbose than um, Amazon's own cloud formation. Um, it supports more than just clouds. It's not just a way to provision Google or Amazon. Uh, it's got stuff in there for uh, PagerDuty, um, Heroku. Uh, there's actually quite a huge list of stuff that you can provision. Essentially, anything with the REST API, you can um, provision through Terraform if somebody's cared about it and, and contributed to it. Um, you can actually store your state. Um, so Terraform executes the infrastructure and keeps kind of a copy of what this looks like, so identifiers and, and such. You can store that in a bucket, and this allows you to, to share um, running the, the Terraform code. Um, I would recommend you separate out your infrastructure layers to minimize blast radius of changes. So if somebody's made a typo, um, you're only making a change to one layer instead of many. Um, so in the end, we end up with something that looks like this. Um, any instance here can be terminated. We're resilient to zone failure because we've got um, two separate availability zones running across here. We've got our front-end application in an auto-scaling group. Um, the auto-scaling groups will run across multiple availability zones. You, don't, you just get that for free. You just say, hey, I want to run in two or three availability zones, and Amazon will then honor and make sure there's at least something in each availability zone. Um, we've got our simple queuing service in the middle here, which is acting as our integration between these two. We're loosely coupled between our infrastructure layers. Um, we've got a master database running in one availability zone with a slave in another. We lose this availability zone, Amazon will automatically fail over for you. This is the same in Google. Google will do this uh, for you as well if you're using Cloud SQL. Uh, well, second generation instances anyway. Um, and we've got a read replica in a separate region. So we, if we do lose a region, something catastrophic happens. Um, uh, perhaps a, a bit of a sore subject, but maybe a terrorist attack destroys the infrastructure and we lose Dublin. Um, it's not entirely impossible. A lot of infrastructure had been bombed in London in the 70s. Um, well, we've got our data. We can provision, run our Terraform scripts, get everything back up and running, because the one important thing we have kept is our data in a separate region. Um, but we haven't got the expense of keeping all this running just in case. You know, we can provision all of this in a matter of minutes. And I think a DR plan that takes a matter of minutes to execute uh, is far better than the expense of having something always running. So in summary, have attitude. Be continuous. Refactor to the cloud. Infrastructure is code. Plan to fail. And data is king. Any questions? Presumably, obviously, the, 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 the ideal answer is somewhere half or in between. But uh, I was just wondering if you are thinking about moving several systems and you can't tackle them all at once or whatever, and you say, right, well, we'll take an unambitious approach to this one, we'll lift and shift, drop it into the cloud the way it is. Um, are, you, are you typically going to see cost savings there, or are you actually going to pay for a bunch of features? You know, you're paying for all the cloud ability which you're actually not using. And is it actually a good step to then converting it later, or is it a really bad idea because you're just going to have this mismatch system? 
Um, it does really depend on the, the kind of the whole scenario. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, actually, moving stuff to get out of a lease or something like that, and you know, kind of quickly getting into um, the cloud and then refactoring once you're in the cloud is a valid strategy. Um, the danger is that it's an intention. You get there, you never, um, you never actually do something about that. Something else takes, you know, higher priority. Um, so you know, if you can push for it and you can get it so that you can get to a nice, clean state in the cloud, fantastic. But the reality is that's often not the case. But I, I guess my question was, if you do get stuck on that halfway step, are you going to be hemorrhaging cash compared to when you were running it in your data center? Um, again, it. it depends. Uh, quite often what happens there is you end up uh, over specking to start with uh, and so you are spending way more money on an instance that turns out to be quite idle uh, and you end up downsizing that instance. So you can get to a point where it's not just kind of bleeding cash um, but you know, that's your kind of stunted um, scalability there then. Um, you're, it won't be quite as expensive as running in a data center, but you're not getting the full cost savings that you could achieve. Uh, so I, do, I, I know we're, we've only run a few minutes because of the uh, ten technical complications. Um, if people want to, sorry, having a name gap. Mike. Mike, uh, over lunch. Lunch is served outside. Um, thank you to Tom for sorting things out. Thank you to another name gap for the USB 3 adapter, USB C adapter. And thank you for your tolerance of the, the technical issues. This happens. <laughs> thank you. Very much. Thank you.